Welcome to the Big Honker Podcast brought to you by <clears throat> Boss Shot Shells. Check out them evil geniuses over at Boss. Order you some Stanfield Dines for Dove Season. I'm Jeff Stanfield with the world famous Andy Shaver. Dove Season's coming up, but turkey season is here. So everybody up north firing up in the next couple of weeks. Boss Tom. I think Oklahoma just nines. opened this weekend, maybe. I think you're right. Or this week. I don't even think. I think it was like midweek. Yeah, I think they pushed their season back since I, the turkey numbers are... <clears throat> I ain't seen as much turkey stuff as I have before. I'm inundated with turkey stuff, but I'm looking for it. No, yeah, good for you. With us today, our friend from Michigan, Mr. Corey Lucas. Corey, how are you doing? From with Cedar Run Decoys, I need to say where he's from. Yeah, good, good. How's it? Sounds like uh, sounds like one of you two is getting amped up for the turkey season. I, uh, I that would be Andy. Yes, I love it. Yeah. I absolutely love it. I mean. The weather's usually nice. If you can get a day where no wind, like there's no better place than Texas in the springtime chasing turkeys. See, and I, avoid the snow. Jeff, do you, Jeff, do you get sick of hearing people talk about turkey hunting? Like I get sick of people talking about deer hunting up here it, in no, Michigan. It no, don't, it don't bother me. I appreciate it. I like to stop. If I see turkeys, I'll stop and look at them. I just don't. Andy put the old wife treatment on me. Here, here, here's what it is. If you want your wife to not like something, that you enjoy doing, make her miserable. I don't care a shit what it is. If, if if you golf and your wife wants to come golfing, and I know some people out here listen to me, I don't know why anybody wants to take their wife on a golfing trip. That just down the horse. Like, take, like taking your wife to the casino. Find something that you enjoy doing and your wife wants to be a part of it because she wants to be part of your stuff. Make her miserable. Just like I would be when Michelle goes shopping. She makes me miserable shopping, so I don't ever want to go. She's I'm more than happy. Give her a credit card and let her go. I don't want to go. Andy did that to me on a turkey trip. We went turkey hunting. He made me fucking miserable. He didn't let me shoot. I never want to go back and do it again. He broke me. We were there an hour. How's we were it, there an hour. How's it miserable? It was ter- like you. You did you see turkeys? Yeah. Did yeah. you get? Yeah. We got everything. We had every. No, no. We called in Jake's. No, we didn't get everything because I didn't get a shoot. <clears throat> we called in Jake's. <clears throat> the place that we were, the place that we went to. I knew that there was there was a band of Jake's running around. Four of them. And Could I mean, have been three. I mean, I knew that they were going to come in, no problem. They're they're little menaces. Should have explained that to me. So we're sitting there. We're not there 15 minutes, maybe. And they fire off, and then all of a sudden they show up. And Jeff's like, here they are. And I'm like, no, don't shoot those. Let's wait for the big guy. Don't shoot those. So they walk away. This is in the first 15 minutes. We sit there maybe 30, 45 minutes later. He's like, all right, I've had enough. Let's go. That was suck. That was it. <laughs> never even, Never even let it never even gave it a chance to like breathe or anything like we're fine like we got the whole property like we're, we just it was our first stand that was it yeah, yeah. there's gnats there yeah, mosquitoes and rattlesnakes yeah, i'm no part of that shit i mean no offense jeff but that sounds a lot like my first time i took lily out really turkey hunt. Now, but lily probably doesn't enjoy <laughs> that, it does she? as a nine year old lily that? probably doesn't want to go again does she no, she she's back into it. Okay, she's back into it. But she like we literally had birds gobbling around us. Like they're just working in, and she's like, "All right, I've had enough." I was like, "What? <laughs> what? 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 Like they're right here?" Wait a second. You know, like, I just and and I was like, "No, no, we, like they're coming." And she just got up. We were hunting out of a blind, a pop up blind. She just got up, unzipped the blind, walked out the door. <laughs> no, I'm, right in the middle. Of I would, I'm done. So. I would rather shoot yeah. mud hens than shoot turkeys. I just. I just, there's okay. nothing about a turkey that excites me. Um, I like to eat turkey. It's good. I just, it just does not, man, I'll tell you what, I like to shoot ducks. If you would have given that the whole afternoon, like you probably could have had Whole afternoon? A, yeah, I mean. The hell, I got <laughs> things better to do with my four hours and sitting there swatting <laughs> mosquitoes to shoot a damn turkey? I just, fun. you put me on teal hunt, early teal season. I love to shoot teal. Do I always, do I, do I enjoy that? Yes. Yeah, because it's over in 20 minutes. Yeah. I like the most bang for my buck. I love to shoot ducks. 
I don't mind sitting and shooting ducks. I could sit for four hours duck hunting in the morning easy if ducks you got some a, think, some action every once in a while. I just I think the other thing for you too, Jeff, is is turkey hunting, you gotta be still and quiet. Yes. You know, so like sitting for four hours yeah. still Screw th- or quiet yes. is a lot different than sitting for four hours and, and a duck. That's why hunting. I don't give two shits about shooting a deer either. Yeah. All right. Well that makes sense. I don't sense. like deer hunting, but I love turkey hunting. It's the it, same it, thing. No, there's just enough interaction that I, I hit the mm-hmm. I hit the same notes that I get with waterfowl hunting as far as interacting with the birds and making them play my game. So it's just different enough from deer hunting that I enjoy doing it, but I cannot stand to deer hunt. I have I have guys call me. My good friend Stacy Coker called me the other day. Him and his wife went in Alabama and they shot a turkey. And then he had been at Pearsall in South Texas before our season opened, and he shot a couple of them. And he's all fired up and telling me about them. And I just thought, you poor sucker. You could find something else better to do with your time than that. But I have so many good friends that will call me and tell me their turkey hunting stories, and I'm just like, I don't I don't get it. I just don't ex- see the, si- the excitement of it. Because you gave it 15 minutes. I know. You sh- it's your fault. So you ruined me for it. I And I've never shot a turkey. I am 56 <clears throat> years old. I have never shot a turkey or shot at a turkey in my life. Even with a rifle? Or, yeah, I tried to shoot one in the air with a rifle one time. I bet a guy that I could <laughs> shoot it with a rifle in the air. I missed. You probably shot a poor horseback rider <laughs> two miles away. It was in the Red River up at North of Wichita Falls. So if I shot somebody, it would have been in Oklahoma. But I just, it just did not, it just does not. It just does not interest me that much. Now, I like to look at turkeys. I like to watch them. I like to, the noise, everything about them. I just don't care about shooting them. But I don't care about shooting a lot of stuff either. There's very few things that I would like to shoot. I'd I'd like to shoot a moose. I'd like to shoot a bear. Well, if you, I feel bad for that poor moose guy because if Jeff's got to walk more than a quarter of a mile and it's not done in the first half I, hour, like, I, screw it. I'm he not, flew all the way to wherever to shoot this moose. And first afternoon, he's like, oh, I'm done. I'm not paying $25,000 to shoot it moose but that a moose or a bear two things that interest me i'd like to shoot a swan i'm going to shoot a swan probably next <clears throat> this fall or next fall swans on my bucket list and that's really about it i've shot take his riddling next time before he goes anywhere i just don't i'd i'd rather sit and watch birds i can drive all day and watch birds and i'm happy a lot of people don't understand that though they don't understand the excitement and the entertainment i have of sitting and watching well, you should have let me know that. I'd have, I'd, have, I'd have ran the shotgun. You could have just sat and watched me. You wouldn't have shot them jakes. I wouldn't have. I would have been I, we got would have, and walked. We would have waited. Anyways. Yeah, I mean, I still, I'll still cut people off mid-conversation driving down the road when I see a, you know, a duck, you know, a certain species of duck or a turkey <laughs> on the side. Of, you know, like just mid-sentence, just boom, I'm, my focus is on that. I still enjoy just seeing, you know, I, we were driving around up north by our cabin last weekend and. We spent the whole weekend just driving around trying to see turkeys and seeing, you know, you'd see a hood of mergans around a pond and get all fired up about it. You know? Yeah. Like I'm, I'm the same, same I, way. I love that. We're going to, uh, we're going to be in Maine in June. And one of the things I cannot wait to do is I want to see moose and bears just because we don't have them here. That interests me. We saw a moose or a bear when we were in Washington state nine in the backyard. I just, cause I don't get to see that very often. Me and Michelle were at Cape Cod last year and, and we saw something, and I wish I, she said, You got to go back and get a picture. And I should have had her do a picture. It was a swan preening itself, and there was two wood ducks on a, on a, on a uh, log in front of them, right off the road. Hmm. And it was beautiful. And I actually, ma- it made my whole day to see that because we don't see that here very often. Yeah. We had, we went to Maine, it was probably 10, 10 years ago or so. And, um, we had like rented this this private charter. We we're gonna go out on the on the ocean and go look at. I think it was like puffin and wait maybe whales something during that time period. We get on the boat and the guys kind of telling us what the agenda was and he didn't say anything about puffins or whales. And I was like, hey, I thought we were thought we were gonna go on this like because I've seen a lot of stuff in my life, a lot of wildlife. And he was like, well, no, actually, we're gonna go see. Bald eagles. Ugh. I was like, "Are you kidding me, dude?" I get that. Like, I see they fly over my house <laughs> like once a week. You know, like we spent all this money. We saw one bald eagle at like a half mile away. <laughs> I turned around, saw its nest. Turned around, came back. Yeah, that. that... I was like, Yeesh. I think one of the kids got sick because they were sitting too close to the to the motor. And they were breathing in all the exhaust Ooh. coming off the motor. 
So <laughs> it was just a miserable experience. You know, to see a bald eagle. I'm like, you're in Maine. Right. You're there to see things you can't see other places. Like I'm in West no. Texas. I, we had some bald eagles here all, all winter long. I don't give two shits about seeing a bald eagle. But you show me right. you show me some harbor seals and sea lions and stuff. And I'm all excited because we don't have that. But Maine is a beautiful place for anybody that hasn't been there. This time, we're not staying on the ocean. We're staying up in the mountains this trip. And I can't wait for that. We'll, I mean, we're two hours from the ocean. We'll go to the ocean. We'll eat there. But Maine is just a really cool place. Really, we ate. Uh, we ate forty. I still remember we ate forty-two lobsters when we were Holy there. Cow. for the week. Yeah, we stayed. We were staying right next door to uh, Door Lobster Company, and uh, they were we were buying them at like market, like under market price. You know, they were coming right off the boat, and we, yeah, we just had a setup in the basement of this house. And we would we ate lobsters like every. Were you in forty? Were you in Portland? Uh, no, we were uh, like near Bar Harbor. Okay, up like Bath. Uh, I'm trying to remember, it. man. It's been a decade, so I can't really recall. But yeah, the, the first up towards the first time we went to Maine, I ate so much lobster while we was there that I didn't eat it for a year. When we got back, I was sick of it. <laughs> and what, what, I'd still eat it. I loved like we were not sick of it. We ended up bringing like. I think we brought 10 or 15 of them back and like gave them to our parents and, and things like that. But that's what they gave the prisoners there. Prisoners had the same uh, uh, sentiment as Jeff towards lobsters. They did not want it. Was I like them now. I just I, I got sick of them that one. But trip that's we all went. they fed the prisoners. Yeah, that would get in old pretty May, fast in, in New England. And it was why didn't they feed them like were they easier to catch the mackerel? Cheap. It was like we went when we went there, we were catching mackerel too. You can catch like three of them on a, on a line. Yeah, it, you know, it was just, cheap uh, and uh, nobody ate them. Yeah, it was con- I think it was considered poor man's food back in the day. Like if you had, if huh. like I think I read an article where people, if they ate lobster, they would have to go into the backyard to hide the shells because it was a sign of poverty. <laughs> Not kidding. We, uh, <laughs> we would have been pretty poor people then when we went yeah, there, right? We, I ordered, we, we eat the same place every time we go to Maine. We eat a little place called the Weather Vane in Kittering. It's kind of a a toury trap place, but it's, it's right across from the main uh, lo, uh, trading post. But anyways, I like the food there. They've got... I think I've been there. Yeah, every, if, it's called the Weather, it's called the weather Vane. Vane. It's on the right side of the road. It's a gray building. It's right across from the, the uh, trading post, main trading post in Kittering. Is it like right on that yes, main tourist road? right on the drag. main tourist road right there. And we, eat, me and yep, Michelle yep. up there at least once every trip up there. And, they, and they've got, I mean, she loves the blueberry cobbler there that they have. And, and they always have the same thing. But I ordered last time a lazy man's lobster. And they bring you two lobsters that they've completely deshelled. And they're in a, a little crock cont- uh, type deal with butter. And, they've all, and, and you don't have to crack them or nothing. It costs like two dollars more. I'm like, hell yeah, that's for me right there. That's it. Yeah, it's called a late. Yeah, and they're probably. Yeah, I mean, my time's worth. Yeah, that. <laughs> it's a pain in the ass. Because when the boys were little, every time we'd order lobster, guess who had to uh, crack them all for them? Me. Mm-hmm. Well, I wish I'd have known this whole thing now. But you order them now, and it comes all out. The claw meat, every bit of it's right there, and they do it in the back. I'm like, hell, that's the way to go. Yeah, here it is, right here in the early 1800s. Uh, it was, it was a sign of. Be, it was poor man's food. Embarrassing uh, if you had discarded lobster shells in the yard. It was a glaring indication of lower class. It'd be like eating a, a, Could you a, imagine? a ribeye now. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, is it is it like the chuck roast? Because like, we just smoked the chuck roast this, this weekend. My brother was showing me how to smoke mm-hmm. it. And I think that's the next brisket. I think you're right. Like that's, because that's getting very that's popular. That's become like the next. That things will go yeah. sky high on price then. Yes, because I you yeah. are right. Now that I've now that you mentioned that, there I've seen a lot of videos on how people are, you know, f- uh, jazzing up their chuck roast. You but gonna, I think you're right. I think yeah. it's the next. It's going to be the next thing that it's, you're not going to be able to it, afford. Have you done one yet? I've not. It's just funny how that changes, and you start to you try and predict, like in our world, like what's gonna what's gonna be an identifier of of wealthier or poor people, yeah. like that we, it's gonna like what's gonna flip flop. Right. Trying to predict the, that the brisket yeah. thing does not bother me at all because I'm not a big brisket eater, anyways. Mm-hmm. But when I was a kid in high school, my stepdad did a lot of smoking, and he smoked brisket all the time, but it was cheap. Yeah, very what, cheap. 49 cents yeah. a pound or oh, something, maybe? nothing. I mean, nobody... Number one, nobody had the... 
it was a pain in the ass. It's, it's still a pain in the ass to cook. It takes 12 hours. You got to babysit it. You got to wrap it after a certain amount of time. But nobody had a, a, a method of, like, everybody had a grill. Nobody had a smoker back in the day. So yeah. nobody was buying a brisket. So unless he, you went to the restaurant. Well, even, the, even the pellet smokers have changed yeah. how they cut the meat, right? Like, the brisket, they used to use, like, a pack of briskets were real pro- popular. But then the automatic pellet stove, like, smokers... And the people don't want to maintain them, right? They want to set it and forget it. And so they, they even the meatpacking companies cut different cuts of brisket now just because there's so many people smoking them on those pellet stoves, yeah. you know, pellet grills. I wish I would have just bought a shitload of them when I first got my Traeger. A what? Brisket. I mean, it's expensive now. What, how much is it a pound now? A buck and a half? Six six bucks for up here. It's six bucks for like prime. Yeah, per it's pound. Like four bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck. yeah. So you're probably it's, it's probably like, what three for choice. It's probably three fifty four bucks. I think. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So that's uh, the lowest grade brisket that you could get. Uh, a brisket's ten pounds. Yeah. So you're I mean, paying sixty dollars for a brisket that oh, you used to be able to pay six, seven, eight dollars for. Most of the briskets are like that. I I've been seeing like 13, 14 pounds. You pay seventy yeah. bucks for like a choice. Yeah. Wow, what 70, 60, 70 yeah, bucks. seventy five dollars? I was gonna say. What's a chuck roast? A buck and a half, two fifty a pound. Oh man, I don't I know. At that, I did just. Uh, yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't remember what it was. I can. But it just. I I grew up like the chuck roast was like something you throw in a crock yes. pot and that's it. Right, like there's no other use for it. Just throw it in a crock pot, let it slow cook. And the second, you, it's it's kind of like flank steak had its turn too, mm-hmm. where it was like everyone was just doing flank steaks and tacos and stuff with those, where it's like people start figuring out like, oh wait, it's all just beef, right? Like you can you can cook it the same way you do a brisket, and it's gonna taste very similar. Michelle, and so M- Michelle does a Mississippi pot roast. I don't like roast because we have roast at the lodge twice a week, and so I get burned out on roast. But she does a Mississippi pot roast. I call it sour beef. She puts some. Those por- por- pepperoncini, pepperoncini, peppers yeah. in it, and she makes a sauce for it. And we could, and you eat it with corn tortillas or flour tortillas with a little bit of uh, Mexican cheese on it. It's really good. But it's, a, but it's yeah, a, that's what my brother showed me this weekend. It was called a uh, Mississippi Pobo. Yeah. yeah, same and thing. It's like, yeah, it's that chuck roast with like ranch, like dry mm-hmm. ranch, yes, seasoning and au jus seasoning and pepperoncinis. Yeah, yeah. So like, it's Same deal. Awesome. Have you done uh, beef cheeks yet? No, they're good. It's called it's called barbacoa. It's very very greasy, and there's you gotta you gotta it's gonna come and it's gonna be nasty. But there's like a lot of connective tissue that you gotta cut away. But like you get like these little bitty slabs of beef cheek meat once you cut all that away, and you do it kind of similar to the way you do a brisket. Smoke it. You don't have to smoke it as long. And then about halfway through, you'll pour like beef broth in like a little container and you'll throw all of that stuff in there with garlic, onion, and then let them continue to smoke in that. And then they just, I mean, you just take your hand and they just disintegrate. Yeah. That's so good. Have you had linga? Which is tongue. Tongue. What is tongue? Tongue. The tongue? Okay. I've never, I've never had it. I mean, I had I I remember when I was a kid, I had it one time, but I can't recall anything about it. The Mexicans, it, you know, texture. The Mexicans have perfected making tongue. They cook it in like a crock pot type deal. They pull the there's a there's a tissue that comes off the top of it. They the peel outer, off that the outer tongue. The outer tongue. They move. pull that off and they cook it in a crock pot with some stuff on it. Cut it real thin. Makes the best tacos in the whole world. Well, I know the taco, like the Mexican restaurants here that have it, like it's more expensive. Yeah, it's than- good. Gosh, almighty, it's damn good. I thought tr- I thought Jeff was going to go on like a Trump Trump uh, tirade or something. You sounded like Trump a little bit right there. What the Mexicans? <laughs> great people love the Mexicans. Love the Mexicans. The way the way they cook the tongue. It's the best food in the world. Absolutely love it. A lot of great Mexicans. Yep, a lot of good Mexicans. <laughs> best wor- best workers in the world. I, I thought that's where you were going for a second. The My food, if I had to take the top food to, to eat group, Mexican food would be one or two <laughs> every day. No. Andy doesn't like it. I love it. I don't know how anybody... D- we had it We had it four times last no. week. No. You love it too then. Yes. And that's Mich- a bit That's much. Michigan Mexican food. It's not even the same. We went to a Mexican no. restaurant last night. 
I did not that eat. That is not very good Mexican food. I did not eat. I had a glass of water and I watched everybody eat and I ordered a pizza when everybody <laughs> and we left. I timed it to where I figured uh, they were going to be done with the, with their meal. Walk next door to the pizza joint, put in my order, and then that's what I had. Michelle told me last night, she goes, that's where they were going to eat. And she goes, her exact words were, poor Andy, he probably won't even eat. I didn't. She had no idea you really wouldn't eat. I really did not eat. Everybody was looking at what me. What do you like about it? Like, what's the... I just, I don't, I got burned out on it, number one. I just got burned out on it. My wife, she'll pick a Mexican food joint over like a fancy steakhouse nine times out of ten. I'm right with her. Um, so I just, I burned myself. I think I burned myself out on it. Or as a family, when we go eat somewhere, I'm like, well, we automatically can't go eat Mexican food, which me and Michelle, we go eat Mexican food. At least half the time we go eat somewhere, it's a Mexican restaurant. Yeah. Because we both like it. Well, and I feel like, like at least with Mexican food is you're like getting some of the culture, at least up here. If you find a good Mexican restaurant, it's like you're getting some of the Mexican culture, like the way they prepare food food and everything like that and i think in america it's hard to like if there's very few italian restaurants right that aren't are like true italian they're like americanized or pizza place right you're italian your pizza places are like there's no real culture in that you're just like ordering pizza whereas sometimes i like going into a mexican restaurant and knowing like hey this is coming right from the culture Mm -hmm. it's not like being sent through the american you know, my wife, American one of the home. first times we went to Mexico, she was so disappointed in the food down there. It's not as good. <laughs> she was like, what is this? It's like, where's the chips and hot sauce? Where, you know, where's, where's all this stuff? Oh. I'm like, she's like criticizing the Mexican food in Mexico. She's like, this is not what I thought it would be. I'm like, well, you're in Mexico. It's like, te- not Tex-Mex. It's we Mexican have Tex-Mex food. here. Like, you, okay. but so that's yeah. what she likes. She likes Tex-Mex. She does not like, okay. We go to a Mexican food place in Mexico and. Most of the time, she leaves disappointed. I've had really good Mexican food up north, though. I thought the cartel was going to get us because she was just she wouldn't shut up about it. <laughs> but you can't do that here. But when, when you get up no. north, we went. Me and Michelle ate at a Mexican restaurant, a little town north of Green Bay on in Door County, and I can't remember the little town we were in. But we had been on this island, Washington Island, and all on a car, and there was cherry uh, groves everywhere, orchards, and I'm like. Who in the hell picks all these cherries and shit? She's like, what? I said, I hadn't seen a Mexican nowhere around here. You can't get nobody to work in Texas doing shit like that unless they're Mexicans. I mean, she's just part. I'm not being racist. It's truth. Mm-hmm. Well, right. there was a Mexican restaurant. She goes, there's a Mexican restaurant here. I was like, well, I don't know. We're up north. I don't know about that. She goes, let's just try it. It sounds good. We didn't have Mexican food in a week. I said, okay, let's go in there. We walked in the door. I said, I know who's picking the cherries now. <laughs> Place Found them. Packed. And the food was absolutely amazing but it was authentic mexican food they had the pineapple hall where they they the boats made out of the pineapple and they did they had very very good mexican food there very yeah good. i mean that's what we've got here too on the west side of michigan you know it's a fruit belt right through yes. here so you do have you have a, and then as you go north you get into like asparagus and and more of the like row crop type stuff um but yeah, you get the migrant workers and they've kind of established some of their culture and you can, you can go find Mexican restaurants that are very authentic, you know, I would, um, I would love to go to Italy and just like do all the little mom and pop pizza places or little Italian food joints. Just, and just, I'm not a big wine guy, but like, I think I would love the wine in Italy. I get a buddy of like mine. I would do, I would do a week of doing nothing but eating pizza and pasta and drinking wine and just seeing the the countryside. One of my good friends growing up, his dad was not a big drinker and pretty boring person, to be honest with you. And he had to go to Paris on in business, not Italy, but he went to Paris. Yeah. And he told me when he come back, he said, I've never liked wine in America, but he goes, the wine they have over there, it tasted different. And it was paired with every meal we had wine. And he goes, I can see now why people yeah. drink wine every day. Well, I think over there they don't have all the sh- extra shit that's added to it over here. Because I was listening to somebody and they were like, "I go over to Italy. I go over there to Italy, and I eat nothing but bread and pasta and drink wine." And he's like, "I'll lose weight or I'll I'll maintain my weight." But he's like, "If I eat like that here, I'm packing on 10, 15 pounds in a week." Like I I went to uh, Italy when I was. 23 so i did like all my world travel stuff like figure out the right. world and like get that out of my system in my early which 20s, everybody should do 20s. 
yeah, I didn't like have kids. I didn't have a family at that point. So I just did that. So I went to Italy and I went, I went, I did kind of what you were talking about, Andy, as I went to like the small mom and pop places, like had really authentic Italian, the Italian experience, Italian food. And, you know, you talk about like pizza, right? Like, well, you're not, when you eat pizza there, you can go eat pizza there, but they're not, it's not this big crust that's like, yeah. you know, it's, it's thin. I'm sure they're, they're, uh, the toppings, like, it's just not as bulk. Like, a piece of pizza there is a lot less than a piece of pizza here. Um, I re- I specifically remember the wine. Really? As being just, because I'm not a wine yeah. drinker, but it was just smooth. And it was like every, it was like you were served, like, water and wine at every meal. And so you didn't, I didn't look at it like I was drinking, mm-hmm. you know, drinking. I was just like, oh, this is just almost like an appetizer type right. thing. And it was so smooth. That's what I, I, and that was 20 years ago. I'm still like, that's what's stuck in my head. You, you know, you said something about Italian food earlier. That's one of the things that we do not get in most cities in Texas. Now, I'm not saying there's not some really good Italian restaurants because I'm sure in Dallas and the yeah. bigger cities they are, but I grew up in Wichita Falls. There's not an Italian restaurant. There's a fucking Olive Garden. It's terrible. Right. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Lubbock, it's an Olive Garden. There might be an Italian restaurant there. Abilene doesn't have a good Italian restaurant that I know of. So you, you go, so we got good Mexican food and we also have really good Thai and Chinese food in these places. Well, I mean, you don't, you've never had any authentic Thai or Chinese food. So I went that crew Thai. You don't think that's authentic China, Thai food? Well, I mean, I don't know. I've yes, never had it's, anything. It, it'll burn your asshole coming out. <laughs> well, it's that's, hot. That's the prerequisite. That's <laughs> well, all. That's all you got to look for is what it's like the next day. It's they, the lady don't even speak English. Right. I mean, they're, they're they've got rules at this place you go to. It's like going to Soup Nazi on Seinfeld. I mean, they got signs everywhere. If it's too hot, that's your problem. You know, don't sit at table that's for only guests only. And they got three chairs and tables in the whole place. The food is excellent food. So I'm assuming. I I think. Uh, I think Chinese. There's a. I think there's a lot more like authentic Chinese food than we probably, probably. give it credit for. My my grandma was. Um, my grandma grew up in China. Her family were missionaries in China, like back in the. I mean, 1920s, wow. 1910. You know, and so she. I mean, she spent. I think she left there when she was like, in her mid to late teenage years. So she like learned how to cook. Chinese and everything, and when they they moved back uh, to Michigan, she knew how to cook all this stuff. So me growing up, she would, you know, I worked on the. They owned an apple orchard, so I worked on the on the farm. So all summer long, we got fed like traditional, authentic Chinese food, and it wasn't like from what I can recall as a kid, it wasn't that much different than some of the Chinese dishes that you can get at a restaurant. Mm-hmm. So um, here in Dirk, talk about Japan. They've got it dicked over there. Clean, I mean, clean. He said it was totally clean. Never went into a public restroom that was not just immaculate. Um, just you could almost eat off of the toilet. All the public transportation was clean. You felt safe. Like he's like they're light years ahead of where we are in America. Not a mixed culture, right? And that's what he said. He said it's all ho- a homogenized mm-hmm. culture, so it's easy to. I mean, every. It's going to sound racist, but everybody looks like you. So it's easy to it's easier to be nice to people that look like you. You're not a melting pot where you've got all of these different cultures kind of colliding and trying to find their own way. And I mean, he had nothing but great things to say about Japan. Yeah, I hadn't really had much of an interest in Japan until I saw some of the stuff that that Dirk was experiencing and talked to him a little bit about it. And I was like, that's. After talking to him, then I had then my interest was kind of mm-hmm. peaked in going in going there. I did had like zero before that. The language barrier would be awful, I would think. You'd almost have to have a translator, which I guess Dirk's son is he's going he's to be a, a tra- teacher he is over a there. Translator. So I mean, he had a walking translator the whole time he was there, so that was no problem. I'd like to go to Japan and China, but just I think it would be hard. Just one of us, like, oh hey, we're going to go to Japan or China, and then like you're just in it. You'd have to you'd have to hire a guide. I got a. One of our clients and a good friend of ours, he was he does a lot of business in China, and he went to a went to a rave mm-hmm. in the middle of nowhere in the country, and nobody spoke English except him. Most of the places he was, lady that was a bartender there, she asked him to go with him. He thought I thought I was going to die there. I mean, they drove out in the country, 
a, an hour outside of Shanghai or wherever he was at. And, you know, it's, but he, and he goes down there a little bit and he knew a few words and stuff. And, but I, I think it would be neat to explore the small areas of countries. It's kind of like back roads. I had some guys here the other day and all they did was drive around and look at the farmland and stuff. They were from Georgia. They came here. They drove around and so they just want to see different things. And I, and I, and I like that and respect yeah. that. When we were in- that's how I am. Like when I came down and stayed with you guys, um, you know, I had to go out and, and try and do my pilgrimage to find Lily her little uh, trinkets. But um, that's really what I wanted to experience is like, hey, I want to see what the scenery, the landscape, because it's so much different than where I'm from. Like I'm just I've always been really curious and want to it want to see as much as I can when I'm in an area. So I'm rarely staying put. Yeah, you know? I'm a back roads guy. Everywhere we go. I love to go to the back roads. And I like to go in the heart of places. When we were in New York last May, we went to Chinatown and ate at a real Chinese, re- I mean, in Chinatown and ate. And I was the only person in there not using chopsticks. I'd have starved to death if I had to use chopsticks. But <laughs> I like to order stuff that I don't know what it is. Now, I did ask because I was afraid of what I might be getting. But I, I like to see real America, real parts of different parts of cities. I don't want to go to the same place all the time. I want to go to New York and eat pizza at a real pizza joint, you know, in a borough somewhere. I don't want to go to on Times Square and eat at a, a damn pizza Sub- place there. Sbarro's? Yeah. Yeah, Sbarro's. Exactly. <laughs> I want to go somewhere and eat real Italian restaurant. I want to go when I'm – I like going to cafes. I love going to cafes in small towns anywhere we go. One of my best meals this last year when we were doing On the Road with Boss was in Ontario when we ate at that little – place that had the poutini Mm -hmm. just a little breakfast joint we had a cafe at but it was real canadians and 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 i like that more than going to shoney's or some shit Mm -hmm. i want to experience it all so tell us what we got coming out let's let's get on to this these decoys oh you want to you want to talk business business for a little bit how was nwtf for us like on a business side i mean it's always great we have second uh, year there second year uh with a booth yep and um, because we've been in business about four and a half years, uh, we're starting to see that like return customers being able to, to kind of hit these, some of these same spots up and see the same people, yeah. you know, reconnect with them after a year. And I, I've really, I've enjoyed that aspect of it. It's just like, Hey, I know I'm going to see this person again at NWTF. And that's, I enjoy that. It's always tough with the logistics, you know, and traveling and having to haul gear down and. If we end up staying like five or six, we, I think we stay six days there. So, um, but business wise, it's always very productive for us. You know, our stuff is, is higher, higher end stuff. So it's not, tends to not be people like spontaneously or, or impulse buying. It's like people who, who have really thought it out. We have lots of people who come by because they know we're going to be yeah. there and they want to ask specific questions or they want to put their hands on the decoys. So it's always super productive and I don't see us, I see us going every year, kind of no matter what. It's just, it's kind of been a slam dunk. So we have a good time there. Oh. Yeah. It's such a busy show. That was my first yeah. year there and I didn't realize the volume of people that are going to be walking around. What do you think's bigger, Bass Classic or Turkey? Man, I don't know. Those are two big, big shows. They're both big. I mean, they're, they're both the big boys of the industry. Mm-hmm. Is is Bassmasters like is that on the same? Is it in the same location? No, I know it, go, it goes Sorry. around. So last year it was in uh, Knoxville. This year it was in Tulsa. Uh, next Dallas. year it's gonna be in Dallas. So oh wow, they bounce okay. around. So it'll be it's next. all it's all fishing, and I mean just a bunch of diehard people. Um, Big swinging dicks there with lots of money at the boat show. You have to be. I mean, look at what boat motors cost. Like. You're not just going to find your John boat guys wanting a little upgrade. I would like to go to the Miami yacht show just to see it one time, just to walk through there and think about all the shit I don't have. Cause they say it's, it's all big, big, big money, all the saltwater boats. Really? But there was a lot of money at the Bass Classic walking around. I mean, but it, the it, boat motors is just, like Andy said, it's a, a damn bass boat's a hundred thousand dollars plus nowadays. A lot of money. I like the. I like the mixed crowds like that. Like I really, because of who I am, I really connect with like kind of what I would consider the average hunter, mm-hmm. right? Like I'm a really avid hunter, but like, uh, 
what I spend my money on, like how I kind of view how it should be done. I'm kind of like uh, very conservative. And so I like those crowds that I can I can interact with like minded people. And I like Turkey Federation Bassmasters. That is probably like very mixed crowds. Yeah, right? oh, yeah. Like, yes. Where you can you can talk to you're not just stuck in pigeonholed into like, hey, these are all guys that are extremely wealthy right. and it, like it's gonna be hard to connect with them. Right, like he, both those shows, I think probably fulfill that. Yeah, yeah. Like there's that, a lot of rednecks. Yeah, there's a bunch of rednecks yeah. that are there for the free bucket or whatever they get at the door, and like <laughs> that's you know that's what they might get a fishing lure from somebody. And I mean, there's a guy. But there is the guy there that's going there to spend X amount of dollars, yeah. and he's already kind of figured out what he's going to buy, and by God, he's going to do it. I talked. Yeah. In, 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 in five minutes, I talked to a guy wearing overalls that catfish fished on the bank of a river, free place, public hunting. And I enjoyed visiting with him as much as I did anybody. And then five minutes after I got done talking to him, I talked to a guy that was in his private jet asking about where he could land an airplane at Knox city to come on a hunt with eight of his guys. Well, he don't, and a jet that holds eight people is not landing in Knox city international, but that was a five minute conversation piece, a very wealthy, wealthy, wealthy man that, He's he's like me when it comes to turkey hunting. He wants to go somewhere, shoot something, get on his jet, and go back. He's got something else to do. Mm-hmm. But I enjoyed the redneck guy a whole lot more that probably didn't have two bucks. It's funny as the rich redneck guy might have more money than the guy with the jet. Who knows? But he just didn't act it. But just two different worlds there colliding. Yeah, with one common. And I, I've always been like, if you can cut your teeth just you know talking to the average average everyday guy, the average hunter. And you just have that mentality with everyone and you're just treating everybody the same. You get that that repetition. And I I really enjoy Turkey Federation for that reason. Like you don't know who's at the table, yeah. right? Like someone who walks up, this could be an extremely wealthy guy, or this could be the guy that's, you know, got one gun and and you know is poaching half his animals because he can't afford a license. Like you don't know. Yeah. Really. You know, they're all dressed in camo. Right. So they're all dressed the same. That- that's an interesting thing that my wife pointed out to me. I've been going to hunting shows my entire life, and I've never noticed it until her, because she never went to them until we got married. And why are you going to wear camo to a hunting show? You're not hunting. Like, why do you wear camo in town? <laughs> Maybe you were hunting. Well, no, no, no. But when you see guys, you can go to Abilene right now, and you can go eat at any restaurant, and there's going to be some guy come in wearing camo. In the middle of fucking summer. Yeah, but that's a small percentage. Like, a large portion of the people that are at these hunting shows are wearing camouflage. Well, I guess they want people to know they hunt. I don't know. I don't get, but I don't get yeah, it. Yeah, I wear like, a, I'll wear a camo hat like today. Yeah, I wear a camo but hat. But that's because I wear that hat all the time, yeah. right? Like, I don't take it off. I might have four or five different hats. Yes. But I don't generally wear camo. Like, I don't wear it to shows typically. Um, I don't generally wear it out unless it's like, oh, this coat is just the one that's closest to the door and most convenient. Yeah, yeah like I'll put on a yeah. camo hoodie, but like you said, it's just it's there yeah. and I'm going to throw it on and I'm going to walk out the door yeah. and not think anything about it. But I would never go to a hunting show wearing uh, mossy oak bottomland pants. No, nope. like I just wouldn't do it. I've but got, that's what everybody yeah, there what, was doing. You see people like with their muck boots, yeah. their pants and their jacket. On, yeah. Right. Like at one of those shows i'm like we're not even in hunting season. no so it's not like, raining outside you don't need mug boots on <laughs> i've got yeah it's 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 kind of strange sometimes but like i i'm also part of me is like that dude lives and breathes I, this yeah. obviously maybe so, that's it hey. where he needs to buy some other clothes yeah. maybe that's it yeah maybe that's i've it. got is he only one camo thing that i wear ever and it's a cedar run deco- uh, hat you gave me it's kind of it's oh, kind really? of a light okay. greenish looking hat same camo but it's a light green one that's the only camouflage hat that i ever wear i don't ever wear oh, i don't thanks. ever wear camo anyways Mm-mm. i don't even know if i own anything camo i've been kind of getting to uh even for waterfowl hunting is uh you know your your block color basic colors earth earth tones because there's so much of this fad thing yes. too and and i'm like if i can throw on a wax canvas wax cotton jacket it's never gonna go out of style Mm -hmm. not that style is my biggest thing but like i just it's easier that way like i can keep wearing this thing till i wear it out you know i and same with i think waiters are going that way too i love like your booth setup i love it because you've got like the filson jacket and you got like that that setup and 
there's no other jacket on earth that would tell a story like an old tin cloth jacket that's just been through, yeah. just been yeah. beat and abused and just worn it in every situation. Like you said, throw it on going to dinner or you're going to wear it to the yeah. duck blind. <clears throat> I mean, yeah. Yeah. There's like so blood personal. down mine. There's like blood stains. There's muck on the muck stains on the sleeves yeah. from, from hunting in the Mississippi. And you're right. Like I'll wear that thing into a restaurant, you know, and those people don't <laughs> there. It's just like, and I told my wife, cause she actually got it for me for Christmas a couple years ago. And uh, I told her, like, you're probably going to end up burying me in this jacket. <laughs> you know, if it's not getting inherited by somebody like it just and I, I think you struggle with the camouflage yeah. um, a bit with that. Right. Like, I think it's harder to kind of carry on that. Although, you know, there's like Camel Retro, for instance, he's doing a good job of trying to bring some of that to life and keep some of that, you know, the older stuff around. Yeah. But. Yeah, like nobody's gonna really care, and I mean, unless it somehow gets a vintage, I don't know. But like nobody's gonna care about that Sitka jacket that you got, that's in Optifade or whatever, whatever camo they right. have. But like, if you get your grandpa's tin cloth jacket, that like you look at it and you see, like you said, all the different mud and blood and just the wear on it on the on the elbows and the back, like yeah. that tells a story. That I mean, I just, it just it transcends time almost. Yeah, and we've got that mannequin at the shows, right? And uh, I couldn't tell you how many people were just like, we're walking by, had no interest in like stopping and talking, but they they would like pause for a minute, look at the jacket, look at me, and they'd be they'd say, Bill, Wilson. and they'd just keep walking, right? Yeah. Like it just is iconic, right? And I think, um, I, I know there's some really good brands that are getting into that, right? Like looking forward, forward thinking like mm -hmm. that, almost backwards forward thinking, like, hey, let's keep things somewhat traditional so that they never go out of style. Yeah. Right. Like, I mean, it worked. I mean, that's the thing. Like your, your great grandpa didn't have near the, the blinds and the decoys and he'd out kill you every day of the week. And he was out there in a, in a flannel jacket or plaid jacket and flannel shirts. Like just get your hide right. And you can, you can make anything disappear. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it kind of transcends into, all the different gear we have in waterfall and so i mean i'm not i love plastics i love silhouettes for the reason that they're kind of made for it's like hey like people need to put out big spreads mm -hmm. you need to have entry points for people into the hunting community and i think those are extremely valuable for that but even those are fat like you know like if you see somebody with old oh, storm front flambos i'm not ragging on them but you'll be like man that guy's needs to upgrade his decoy rig mm -hmm. right like you even see that amongst the gear we're using yeah you know or a certain gun mm -hmm. you know it and but then you step back way before that and people are like oh that's cool yeah right like if you go back into the 40s and 50s and you're using that stuff all of a sudden people think that's cool yeah you know and it's I think that's where I'm really encouraged to like Cedar Run is that it's just I never have to worry about that. Right. I never have to worry about like keeping up with a fad. Never have to like just keep doing what you're doing and get better and better and better and better. At yeah. It, right. Like that's the sole focus. So you're not distracted with like what's hot. Oh, we got to have this new marketing ploy. We got to change the design of our logo or we got to, you know, we got to create this, this fancier looking decoy that's got this technology added to it. Like you can just keep in your lane and get really good at what you do, you know? Yeah. And in the end, you're going to have that high quality product, like a Filson jacket, mm -hmm. right? Cause they've spent so much time just honing. Do you think they've screwed up by going to not make them in America anymore? I think I so. I think so too. I yeah. think that's a big thing. I've got two pair. I've got five or six Filson shirts and I've got two sets of bibs. I got the green and the, the black, the, the wool ones. I love them. I wear them a lot in the winter time. But I've had people say something to me recently. More than one person has said something this last past season. Are those Filson bibs? Yeah. You know, can you believe they're not made in America no more? I'm like, you know, I, I don't understand that. I would rather have paid $50 extra for my bibs and made in America than to have them make overseas. Yeah, I don't know what was happening like that. I, I mean, it's got to be labor costs, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, in all your textiles, none of them are made here. So No, no. Like, but, but if you did make them here... And people had to pay extra. They wouldn't care to be paying extra for an American-made product, I think. If it's high quality, yes, yes. right? Like a lot of companies just try and rely on made in America. And they're like, I, you know, like that's what our, our sole 
that's kind of like our, 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 that's what we're going to base our whole company on, right? It's in made in America. But there's, there's companies in the outdoor world that have done that and are not doing real great, you know, because they haven't, they're not out competing the tech, you know, like if you got Sitka, right? I'm going to take two companies. I mean, I think Forlo is made in America, right? Which one? Forlo. Forlo? I don't know about that. F-O-R-L-O-H. Right. You haven't, most people haven't heard of yeah. them. Yeah. Right? I'm not pitching them. I'm just saying, like, if your product isn't a, more attractive than other products like Sitka, it doesn't matter if you're made in America. You know, like, right. they're not thriving. The, um, the best hoodie, even the, though made. the best hoodie on the market is the Boss hoodie. 100% made in America. And it is the best, by far the best product made in America, is their yep. hoodie that they serve. So someone's US got cotton. I mean, the whole shebang. the whole thing is made in America. It's dyed. Everything is made in America. They got a textile mill. I'm not going to say where. I don't want to get in the middle of all that. But that makes their stuff. But they do it all in. They do it all. It's all made in America. You pay for it, but it's a hoodie that'll last you. Yep. And it's a I call it a Yankee hoodie. That hoodie down Hot. here is a December, January, February hoodie at max. You know, you're not wearing it out to you get cool at nighttime going to your kid's softball game because you'll be sweating like some bitch. It is a well-made, good quality product. Now, I'm not, yeah. I do not own any Lululemons. I don't know shit about Lululemons. My granddaughter loves them, but I saw where someone is making American-made Lululemons and they're doing spinoffs of them and they're making them all in America. I heard something, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard that the reason that they made that. Lulu, the reason they called it Lulu Lemon is because the Chinese would not be able to say it or reproduce it, so they couldn't rip it off. Huh? Lulu Lemon. The name? Yeah. Okay. I thought you meant they couldn't rip off making it. You're no, right. you're I a think, racist, some bitch, Andy. I, that's just what I've heard. Yeah. Is By that another racist? Is that that? <laughs> is I don't know what they, kind of show you think we got, Andy, but that's not us. They named it that way so that the Chinese wouldn't be able to say it. <laughs> Lulu Lemon. <laughs> and then, like, you know, nobody would know what they were talking about if they were, like, trying to rip off this thing. Sweet and sour? Have you seen the, the, ru- have you seen the Ruru Rimmons? <laughs> Ruru That's just what I heard. The like, Ruru Rimmons. I'll fact check it, but... Yeah, you might want to fact check I'm going to fact check that. <laughs> well, bad, we don't have to worry about offended Muslims, and I don't think with the Ruru Rimmon people we got to fix. I don't think we have a lot of them, but... Um. <laughs> Roo, roo, yeah, I mean, we we make um, <laughs> we make decoy bags all made in America, yeah. right? And and I think the big thing with it is that you can control the quality, right? Like, and you be very responsive. So if you have a quality control issue in China, it may take you a year or more to get that fixed. Mm-hmm. You know, with the communication barriers and just the the shipping barriers and everything else, like. It's such a slow process, whereas in America, like, hey, that could be done next week. We can change our production, get something better, right, real quick. They're also going to screw your your eyeballs out. They're going to screw your eyeballs out eventually. If you do enough business in China, it's just a matter of time before someone is making your same product and stamping a different name on it. Yep. Yep. I mean, you control it. You've got patents here. They're respected, and you do a good product, and, and it's locally made. But when you go to China mm-hmm. and make something, a decoy, a golf club, a car for a part, it don't matter what it is, they're going to they're gonna snag and figure a way to do everything. There was a hunting show that we went to 15, 20 years ago, and a guy made a part, had like some uh, vice grip deals that he was selling there, and he was having them made in China real cheap. Well, the next year he went to the same show. Well, somebody was selling the same damn knockoffs for half price. The company that was making his was also making them on their own and had a guy selling them for them. You know, they, and they steal products all the time. So, okay, so I think I found a quote from from, Ruru Rimen? from the Lululemon founder. The reason the Japanese like my former skateboard brand Homeless was because. It has an L in it, and Japanese marketing firm wouldn't come up with a brand name with an L in it. L is not in their vocabulary. It's tough pronunciation for them. So I thought next time I have a company, I'll name it with three L's in it and see if I can get three times the money. It's funny to watch them try to say it. So, <laughs> uh, so that's why we have Ruru Rimmons. Lululemon. <laughs> Confirmed. 
<laughs> now this this article could be bullshit, but I have gone to the internet and it does support basically what I was saying. Whether or not that's authentic, I don't know, but I'll it is out there. I'll never call them Lulu Lemons again. It'll be Ruru Lemons from now on. So. <laughs> I was not totally off base. I have heard that. I didn't just make that up. Well, I'm going to tell you where he's smart man at, besides the Ruru part, is he's figured out to take some cheap-ass yoga pants that Reebok makes well, that's for all $10 they or $15 are. 100%. and sell them for $100. And it's just, it's the name brand. It's the, I don't even know what their logo is, but you got to have them if you're going to be a college girl now. Um, or Blake, <clears throat> Poppy. Yeah, Blake likes them. He wears some Rurus. There was something else I was about to bring up, and I can't remember what it was. All right, let's. I, when you figure it out, we'll I let you know. Pee. Let's let's talk decoys now, Corey. What do we got coming out? Yeah, yeah. So we're, uh, you know, Jeff, you brought this idea up to me a while back, and you've actually been bugging me for a little while um, on this certain species yes. of, of decoy, the Eurasian widgeon. Yep. Um, you've been you've been kind of bugging me to to get one done for you, and so we. Through our conversations, we came up with this uh, idea of doing a big honker podcast decoy. So it's kind of a, I hate the term collaboration. I think it's a buzz term, but like that's what I'm going to use right now. Um, this collaboration where we're kind of taking your idea and your vision and we're, we're, we're making a, a Eurasian widgeon decoy that's specifically for the big honker podcast. Um, I'm excited about it. I actually have the prototype sitting right next to me. Um, it's all all finished, ready to go off for our all our media content. But um, we're gonna do it's gonna be full size Eurasian widgeon hand carved decoy. It's gonna have your big honker podcast logo on it, your guys' signatures on it. Uh, we're also gonna include uh, numbered bands, so each one of these decoys will be numbered. Um, and then we're also including the uh, uh, print of the original uh, decoy pattern, the sketch of the original decoy pattern. Oh, that was cool. So it's it's something we haven't done before, but I think it's really cool to show people like how this how these decoys come to be. You know, an original plan. So think of like a blueprint of the the decoy pattern. So do you do you do a blueprint for every one of your decoys first? I do, I do this one this one's got a little more detail right because right? typically I would just have to and I've got that here too I can I can show it on the screen here but um, this one I wanted to give people that weren't knowledgeable in the decoy carving process a little more information so they knew like okay these are the points and I mean I think it's cool because I'm not really a uh, I'm not super possessive about some of my stuff. So I'm like, Hey, if somebody wants to take this, make a pattern of their own and, and carve their own Eurasian widgeon, that's, that's awesome too. Um, but they can kind of see what goes into the thought process. So yes, I do do a blueprint of every pattern or I'm shifting. I'm constantly kind of what I would say, improving the, the templates. Um, but this one does have quite a bit more detail. Like I'll just show it on this, like the head pattern on the screen if I can. Yeah. So, it's going to show some call outs, you know, dimensions on there that I wouldn't normally do. I don't know if this body, this body pattern is going to show up real yeah, good, but so. um, I kind of show you what the, the different lines are and what they mean. Um, so that'll be on a print that's going to be included with the decoy. That's badass. And we're hoping to release those May 1st is the, is the date that we're going to be pushing those out. So I'm excited. I'm super excited about, you know, partnering with you guys and, um, and I know your guys is kind of your hearts come out in this too. Um, because you're, you're Jeff was, was pretty insistent on, on raising money for charity with these decoys and having it be a good cause, um, beyond just us finally getting to partner on something and us finally producing a Eurasian widget for Jeff. <laughs> um, the, the ability for you guys to give back through this is awesome. And I think that, that that was unprovoked by me. Um, I think that's something that probably gets lost in you guys a lot is you do have really good hearts. Um, I've experienced it. My family experienced it. Appreciate it. Um, and so, yeah, that's what you guys are doing is you're going to be giving portions of the proceeds to 
scholarship fund and it's we have another decoy coming out i don't know if you guys want me to let's, talk about that let's yet let's talk about um, it too the, the first decoy the eurasian widget and the proceeds are, are our proceeds are going to go to my dad's scholarship fund is what it did and it'll be going to seniors at, in in knox county whose uh, mom or dad is a first responder or they live with their grandparents and they're a first responder here in town whether it's an, an ambulance guy a policeman a fireman or you work at the hospital that's where the proceeds from this one go and then the second decoy, if we're going to talk about it, is going to be a, you made Michelle a decoy. It's a yellow rubber ducky with an orange beak on it. It looks just like a little rubber ducky. And the proceeds from that are going to go to St. Jude's Children's Hospital for pediatric cancer. So. Yeah. So they're, um, and the, the, I'm very transparent when we do these type of partnership deals. So. When you go online to order them, it'll show you how much is going into these these funds. And then for the um, the rubber ducky one, so we're going to sell these rubber duckies, um, portion of the proceeds going to St. Jude's. But then I'm going to carve a, a oversized version of it and gift that to St. Jude's, and they can sell that in their um, they can auction that off in their their auctions there. So I'll allow you guys to go present that to them. That'll be awesome. That'll um, be awesome. I think that's a really cool thing. And then those that have bought, and maybe it's something we can consider for the Eurasian too, but those who have bought the the rubber ducky then could go possibly bid on that too and, and have a matching pair, you know, an oversized one and a regular one. So that's coming out a couple of weeks after the Eurasian widgeon. I'm going to stagger them a little bit, but um, I'm super excited. Super excited to and, do this. And uh, the the duck one, the the rubber ducky one, Michelle will sign the kill of those. Everyone of them will have her signature yes. on it. It's her baby and it's her thing. And so that'll go for, yep. and that's really true to her heart. A big blessing is the, any kind of cancer. She lost her dad and lost my dad to cancer. And knock on wood, I hope I never have to go through cancer with the grandkid. But that's a very good, good, good cause. And if you think you've had a shitty day, all you got to do is go to a children's hospital to see your day is not very bad usually. My uh, my oldest son, he had he has seasonal asthma. We've kind of figured out, but about once a year, he'll he'll have an episode where he can't breathe, and we got to go to the emergency room. Anyway, one of the last times that he had it, they flew him to it was Cooks, it wasn't St. Jude, but it was it was to Cooks Children Hospital, and you know he was going to be okay. Um, his oxygen was just at a level where they weren't comfortable treating him here and they wanted just to get him there just to be, to be on the safe side. But I knew he was going to be okay. But like, I remember walking out of that hospital and there was a, uh, family. I'll get a little choked up talking about it, but it was a mom and a dad and they were just on the phone balling. I don't know who they were talking to, but, uh, we were walking out with my son and he was, he asked, well, what are they crying about? And I was like, some kids don't leave here, you know, like this is it. And that was a, it was, a, you know, it was a touching moment and it was something, it, hopefully, I, and I doubt he even remembers it, but you know, I remember walking, walk, he'll, he'll, walking remember, he'll remember, I remember it. walking the hallways to his room and you know, there's kids in wheelchairs, no hair and you know, parents are just being as brave as they can for him. But I'll never forget that couple outside. Was that, was that part scary though? Cause your kids in the same hallway right yeah. like your kids in the same hospital yeah, yeah and everyone around you know like you see i mean as a parent i think about trying to put myself in those that situation like if you see all the other parents they probably thought they weren't right. you know they're going there and they're like oh this will be fine yeah. right so it's it's certainly got to like snap you into some sort of reality when you see your kids in that same hospital yeah i mean a, right? a little bit but by the time i'd gotten there you know i knew he was kind of getting a clean bill of health and they were just kind of monitoring but um He's gone through it since he was a year and a half, two years old. The first year was really, really scary because we didn't know what was going on. Um, and it it's it's crazy because it, I think he was 18 months old. It was like my wife's first night out after having our oldest. She went out with a couple friends. It was around Christmas. Um, they had a paint party. They were all, you know, you know, drinking wine and like painting uh, Christmas ornaments. And um he was in bed with me and I just remember like something wasn't right. And I called her and, um, he was just really, really struggling to breathe. So that was, that was the most, that was the scariest time is just because like, we didn't really know 
how to handle it or what to do. And then um, after that, we've kind of got a little protocol that our pediatrician had given us. So we can kind of treat it at home. But yeah, it, the first couple of times were really, really scary because he couldn't tell us what was going on. Like now he's right, old enough now. Right. He's like, I'm having, I'm struggling. Um, but those first couple of years when he couldn't talk and it happened, it was, it was very, yeah. very frightening as a parent and especially a new parent, you know, mm -hmm. first child, first child. And, yeah. you know, you're already kind of paranoid about every little thing that, that happens, but mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, it was definitely a sobering moment whenever we got there. And like you said, you're walking the same hallways as them. Um, but they got them under control. And I, you know, I do, I carve decoys for a few different organizations and different causes and things like that. And for me, that's the, that's the benefit I get from like putting your hands on something and making something with your own two hands. It's like through that process, you could be you're really thinking about like, who am I carving this yeah. for? Why am I carving this? Right? Like you can't avoid that. Mm -hmm. right? You can talk to any carver. They're like, you're spending so much time on that decoy that you, you get attached to its cause. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you do. Right. Even if somebody's just going to go hunt with it and that's, you're getting attached to, Hey, I'm helping this person build a legacy. Right. And so when I get the opportunity to come in and carve these decoys and know that, through your guys' partnership, they're going to go on and and this is this is something bigger than just me whittling in the shop. And I know that while I'm doing it, it makes my job a whole heck of a lot more yeah. enjoyable, right? And valuable. So I appreciate you guys doing this. I appreciate you guys, you know, coming to me and and offering this up opportunity up to me. Was the Eurasian Widgeon a pain in the ass to get the color schemes down? Um it's you know, you think widgeon, it's quite a bit different than American widgeon when you really start to, to look at it. Um, I think when you look at a color scheme, it's probably simpler than an American mm -hmm. widgeon uh, as far as like individual paint strokes. But um, it's brand new to me, right? Like, um, and I do everything off reference photos. So I go dig through online, find as many different reference photos from different angles as I can trying to weed out anything that might be because a lot of people take pictures of like unique birds, mm -hmm. right? Like, Oh, this is a unique Eurasian widgeon or an hybrid or something. So you're, you're, you're trying to filter through all that. Um, and then just trying to create that paint mix, right? right? That, that matches. So it wasn't, it's not that it's, it's difficult, but it's, it was all new, right? Like top to bottom. I've never done one. Um, I've done like a hybrid one, uh, but never just a straight, Eurasian widgeon and you know then I'm drawing patterns so I'm taking you know you may take the existing widgeon American widgeon you know and you're looking at like okay how much what's the size difference between Eurasian American then then you're looking at what head position do I like that I think is going to be a little bit unique so I I kind of tightened the head down a little bit made it a shorter neck um and I like how it turned out I, I'm like I'm always, whenever I do something, I'm like, okay, this is what I would do next mm -hmm. time, though. Right? So yeah. I'm still in that phase. Yeah. Yeah. I'm looking at the American Widgeon versus the Eurasian Widgeon. At, like, to your point, like, there's a lot more going on on the American Widgeon. Yeah. Yeah. Especially in the head. Yeah. Like, you got that green, you got the white, you got the speckling. Yeah. Like, basically, you know, once you get the Eurasian kind of, once you master or nail down that paint color. <clears throat> yeah. That chestnut head. Yeah. It's, a, it's easier to do than on American widgeon where you have all the ticking in the head. Right. Uh, so we're, some of the bodies similar. I, I, I look at the body as being like paint wise, very similar to like a green wing mm -hmm. teal. Um, like the back and the, the wrong, like there's, there's some similarities there between a green wing teal. Um, but I do like playing with the, the colors in like, I'm going to paint it how I see yeah. it. Right. Or I'm going to paint it how I like this reference photo the best i think this has the most pop or whatever and so there's a lot of species i do that might be slightly different like on a black duck i put a lot more purple in the speculum because i just think it looks yeah. cool right yeah. like and, and it's more eye-catching in some at, to some extent like that's what decoy makers are doing even the plastics um but yeah i like the, the Eurasian widgeon, I think I like that the subtleties and the little green patch around the eye mm -hmm. that you don't see that uh, iridescent. Um, and I just like the shape of the head. 
So it's very similar to the American Wigeon, but I just tucked it down more. So it's it's got a beefier neck. Are they are they similar in size? I've never shot it. I've never even seen a Eurasian Wigeon. I don't think. I mean, but from what you could tell, yeah, are they pretty well a Wigeon to Wigeon? Yeah, similar in size. Is Jeff is uh? Is, I'm curious to see why Jeff was like cued in. On why it. I like American the the Eura, Eurasian Wigeon? It's like yeah. my unicorn. Oh. It's something that okay. I've I've got a beautiful one mounted in my I've got a we shot a hybrid one oh fifteen years ago. It's a half it's a half and half. And then I've got one mounted that's a full full Eurasian and I think they're beautiful ducks. And it's just my it's my I don't know, I guess my unicorn. Because of the rarity just, of just it. They don't happen very much and they're a beautiful yeah. bird and I just everybody that talks about them on the West Coast I'm jealous of. And I just, I think they're cool. And I think I, I, I'm not the only person like that. I don't think out there like <clears throat> the Mandarin mm -hmm. duck, people are starting to shoot some Mandarin ducks. They have mm -hmm. absolutely a wood duck. I have, they're like a pimp. Mm -hmm. I have no, I have no use for them at all. They just don't even excite me. Just all flash. All flash. No uh, substance. All, all we, flash. I mean, the, we caught a man, caught a Mandarin duck when we were duck banding. When I worked for the state, um, I used to do a lot of duck banding and we caught a Mandarin duck in a trap with a wood with wood ducks which is kind of cool we ended up taking it to the bird sanctuary i think they might have clipped its wings and kept it at the bird sanctuary mm -hmm. here in the area but it's kind of fun one so yeah they're flying in those wood duck flocks yeah i don't and, know if and, and they're probably released birds you know people's people's pets or you know they buy a mandarin duck and that here at least this part of the country i think that's how it's happening not sure. Now, if I shot one, some bitch would be all over social media. I'd be so proud because <laughs> it'd be a Mandarin duck to shoot. But wood ducks don't excite me at all. Like you've both two of my best friends up here have passed away, and you've you've carved their urns, and they're on. I call it death row. Is the place I've got them both of their decoys at. Ed was always flashy. Thought he was a pimp, so I got a wood <laughs> duck for him. Harry was all about business. Wasn't flashy at all, and he's got a gadwall you did for him. I think they fit their personalities. Yeah. So yeah. A Mandarin duck would be cool, but a Eurasian widgeon. When when I go, that's what I want them to put me in. Fuck death you! Row. You're getting a farm duck. <laughs> <laughs> you're getting a white Muscovy or something. You're getting a white farm duck is what you're getting. Well, do you you have the Eurasian done then, so we take a look at it. Yeah, yeah, I've got I've got the one. It's actually getting sent out today to uh, to get video and photo content, so we can get it up online and people can take a look at it um, before they they buy it. But I can. Try and hold it up there here. It it's kind of tough to see, to see in Oh, the, that's a beaut. I'm look telling you right there. I'm telling you right love now. Love it. Love it. Love it. It'll hunt too. It'll so hunt. Hell if, yeah, uh, it will. If people are want to throw it in their rig, encourage them to do that. You know. So I've got a pintail that I got this pintail that I bring to the shows that shows like, hey, you can shoot the thing up, right? <laughs> like you right. can shoot it up and it'll just tell stories. So why not take the big honker podcast, go put it at the front of your spread? That's right. right? Put some put some contrast I'm, out there. I'm going to give you an, a throwback also on something that's kind of interesting. My dad was a thinker. My dad was a lot of things. He was a redneck. He was a thinker. Did a lot of things that would... He put a goose suit on one time. So there's some things he did I was not real proud of. But when I was a kid, we had a regular set of decoys. We had goose decoys, duck decoys. My dad painted a mallard hen solid white and put it in his decoy spread every day. Just so people, you could see it from way off. Hmm. Just a solid white albino mallard hen of a flambeau or a GNH decoy that he used to spray can some Krylon probably and spray painted the some bitch white. And threw it in the decoy. So anything with some color like that yellow duck, you can put in your spread. So yeah, I like. I mean, that's why I run northern shovelers. Yeah, right? that's why I run shovelers is just all that white on them. But yeah, I, I can't see that it hurts, especially a white one. I mean, that could just be a seagull. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. Like from a distance. Kill D. I mean, you know, that's not going to hurt. We shot many and many and many ducks over that thing, and it was just one female. It was a it was a mallard hen, but it was spray painted white, and it went in our spread every day. You wouldn't even have to like complete paint it totally white. You could just like kind of with your spray can just kind of hit it when, just to where it's just a little bit lighter. If, if, but I mean, the lucky duck spinners, the the wings are white. I mean, that's all they're seeing is that flash. Yep, they're seeing right. the white and black flash. 
We, yeah. if you would have been a hardcore purist waterfowl hunter in 1980 and you pulled up on our spread at the dairy, we used to hunt out all the time. You would have seen maybe a dozen decoys. We didn't put out a lot of decoys. We didn't have to, when we were just hunting there. Cause it was so, it was, it was easy. It was on the X all the time, but there would be one white mallard, one white mallard in that spread. And we hunted out of a decoy or a blind. that was a Holstein cow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a square box that was painted like a Holstein cow had a tail on it, udders on it and the whole fucking thing. And the head, would, <laughs> the head would swivel in the wind. And we shot hundreds of thousands of ducks is what we shot. Thousands, not hundreds, thousands of ducks out of that thing. And if you'd have pulled up, you'd have thought there is no way in hell. These guys know what the hell they're doing. We shot a lot of ducks doing that. Wouldn't you like, would you give about anything to go like replicate that today? I mean, is, or is it like, like if you had the opportunity, if that blind was still laying around, you had the opportunity. Like, would that be a highlight of your season, or are you yes. are you one of the people that's like, eh, you know, that was fun back then, but I wouldn't want to do it again. No, my dream in life would be to have enough money I could have a museum, and I would get I try to get that old blind. I have no idea where it's at now. I replicate it and put it in that old, that museum, just because. Another thing we did too as a kid growing up is when it back then we had winters, and when it would freeze up. We would we'd hunt over them old Victor decoys, them old some bitches. If you threw them and hit somebody with them, you'd knock them out. <laughs> and they were dangerous. Were they? That hard plastic, and they just had flat bottoms on them, so you could stick them on the ice. Yep. And that yep. that would take laundry bluing and put it around them, so it looked like water. Oh wow! I've heard of people doing that. I've never seen it. If you're we, not not cheating. You're not trying. Yeah. And so we 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 did that. I'll tell you one thing else he he tried one time. It didn't work too good. Is you can take some black plastic, like a liner, and you can put it in a dirt field, and you can put that in there and put some of them Victor decoys on it. It looks like a water hole. Allegedly. It never worked that I Alleged. saw. Allegedly is a good answer because I was, never seen it work. That was the idea. But that was always dad's <laughs> idea about shit. So he, he was a thinker on that deal. But the white decoy worked. We shot a lot, a lot of ducks over that white decoy. I think I know the I've got a, cow barn was down cost- there. The a customer of mine, he does, oh. uh, he does pelican. He'll he'll do white pelicans. Throw one or two white pelicans in a rig too. Like if you're diver hunting, yeah, yeah. There's there's all sorts of things that I think help. Um, I always wondered though. Sometimes you're when you see a bird flare, the bird then you those those variables are the first ones you want to kick 100%. out. Yes, you know 100%. they're the first ones you're like ah, it's got to be that. It's got to right? be the white decoy. There's no yeah. other explanation yeah. as why that bird just flared. We used yeah. to have a full body goose decoy around here. Y'all planted a net collar on. Somebody did. I don't remember. Yeah, it was back in the day. We had a full body, like carry lot full body decoy, and they painted a damn net collar on it. Lucky. Wasn't much to do back in the day. No, just bored. So, what's the next project that you've got coming up? So, we do a uh, a first edition. So, as I get requests and ha- as I get kind of a, des- a desire to do it i like to introduce a new species so we've got we've got a first and my my plan is we, we release those at every duck opener so we'll be releasing it for another first edition last year we did the cinnamon teal mm-hmm. um this year we're going to do the surf scoter and so we kind of push out a bunch of uh, apparel and and kind of branding for that so i'm excited about that and then we've got um, some different partnerships we're working on, um, trying to kind of fill out, like, if you think about, uh, duck hunters workflow, you know, if you're, if you're getting up in the morning, what's your first thing you're doing, right? And like, what are the tools that you need to do that better, you know, or maybe more convenient. So we're working on some things that kind of go through the workflow, um, for a duck hunter from start to finish, because, you know, as a duck hunter myself, I'm like, oh, I wish I had this. I wish I had that. And I have a venue to be able to kind of explore some of those opportunities and, and develop some things that are even kind of beyond just the decoy. Um, so, you know, motion, for instance, motion decoys is a way to do that traditionally, you know, like non-electronics um, to maybe improve that world a little bit. So we have a, a project we're working on there. And then... Um, decoy anchors were those may come out this fall may not but something that's a little bit different there too um my background's conservation so there's there's some things with the decoy anchors that i think we can get we can make it easier for the duck hunter and be more conservation minded 
So we've got that that may not come out this fall. Um, and so just trying to look at some other things that are even beyond uh, just the hand carved decoys. But we're so crazy busy. Um, we just did shop renovations. Uh, we're in the middle of it, actually. And, and so uh, a couple of the guys are in, in the shop right now uh, working. But the goal is then to have more room for multiple people to be working at the same time. Um, be able to do things like this while the shop's operating, right. right? And it's not interfering. So we're we're doing that right now and just trying to expand the um, capacity because it's like we'll do, I mean, not to divulge too, too much information, but we'll do over a thousand decoys this year, hand carved, you know, like that's a lot of hours. And so just trying to, trying to get more people trained up. And, um, but lots of Ducks Unlimited, Delta partnerships, all that. Well, you do an amazing work and it's a cool shop and I can't wait for this decoy to come out where people can see it and they can go to Cedar Run Decoys and they can buy it online and you'll have these available in a couple of weeks, you said? Yep, May, May 1st and we'll do, we'll like, we'll push it out to you guys so you can share it and we'll share it and it'll be very obvious on when this thing's coming <laughs> out, but I'm going to say like, because they're numbered and you know, a lot of people are really in you know, they, they enjoy that collector's aspect of it um, and trying to get those early numbers. Uh, we are going to have some inventory kind of prepped because we know we're going to get a push right at the beginning. So we'll have some, but typically our decoys take three to four weeks uh, to carve out. So if you're not in that first batch of orders, you're probably going to have to wait a few weeks to get it. Um, and then I believe we're going to try and get some down to you guys. So at the start of the season, you'll have some in-house there at the lodge that people can can purchase as well and then the rubber ducky comes out i have to double check the date but it's right before mother's day so that's a good one for people who you know want to buy a gift for their mom and their moms obviously <laughs> you know maybe they're not into duck hunting maybe they are but like that's a that's a cool one um as well so all that stuff it'll be very obvious and when this stuff's coming out we're going to push it hard so no hidden surprises well, we, we so look you, forward to so it. you're a, so are you going to be able to like hand over some of the responsibilities of the carving to these different individuals are you comfortable with that yeah so i'm a, i'm kind i'm a control freak right. from a quality standpoint right. um and so it's it's difficult <laughs> but our our older daughter jordan she's been working She's been working with me for about two years. Um, so she's learned a lot of like that that foundational stuff that we need, like cutting out patterns, right? Like rough carving some stuff. And then Clayton, who I think you guys have met, he does a lot of the, helps me with a lot of the sales end of things. So shows, um, he's stepping into the shop more, learning some of those, the carving side. We have a, um, a fisher who's doing, who's apprenticing with paint. So I can kind of, I'll never, I love this. I love being in the shop. Mm -hmm. Like I would rather have other people doing that outside the <laughs> shop. I, I could sit in the shop and just carve decoys all day, every day. Um, so I think I'll always be there. Um, for sure. I'm not to the point where I could ever like box up a decoy or have somebody box it up without me looking mm -hmm. at it. Like that's not, I don't think that's ever going to happen. Right. Like I'm too, I struggle with disappointing people. Like if I disappoint someone, I'm like devastated for days. So <laughs> If, if for some reason some, someone got something and it, it was, did not meet their expectations, I would be, it would not be good for me. So I, no matter what happens with the business, as it continues to grow, I'll always be there to put my eyes on it, put my hands on the decoys for sure. But yeah, it's, and it's great to have like young people doing this work and learning it and excited about it. So that's why you're going to continue to grow is because you give a shit about your product at the end of the day. You know, you're not just yeah. rubber stamping something and sending it out there. Like your soul is into each product that you send out there and pe yeah, people I've talked to that. you guys. Yeah. I've talked to you guys about this. It's like when somebody buys a decoy from Cedar run decoys, they're, they're supporting my family, mm -hmm. right? Like this is, and you guys feel the same way. This is the same thing, family business, right? So it's not like you go to work and you sell something. This is like, Someone purchases a decoy from me. This is going to pay my mortgage, buy food for my family. If I don't, if they're not there supporting me, I, I lose right. that, right? Um, and I lose what I feel God's gifted me to do is carve these decoys. 
So it's very, every single customer, every order is very valuable to me, important to me. Um, because being the, the owner and the, the guy that came up with this and, and has worked so hard with it, I can't afford to have a bad customer. Right. I can't have, I can't afford to have a bad customer experience. If there, if it if there is, I need to fix it, you know, cause it's costly to me and my family. And at the same time, those who are willing to help me out are doing more than just helping me. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I don't think I'll ever lose that. I, I hope I don't, I don't see how I could lose that perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, Dude, you're a class act. It's a pleasure. Uh, I'm excited about this project that we got coming up. It's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, there's there's nobody better in the business that we would want to do this with than Corey Lucas and Cedar Run Decoys. Thank you. You've, you've, Thank uh, you, guys. You've Looking out. forward to seeing you guys in person again, too. Hopefully yeah. I can get down there. Yeah. It's in November, maybe. And then, November. Uh, Come we'll, on down. Yep. We'll see you, know, you in November. I, get some I don't see bellies. Well, I'll see you. You're going to be at Delta, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We'll be, yeah, we'll yep, we'll be at Delta. Then. July. I'll bring some. I'll bring some down to Delta. We'll have them available there. Okay. Cool. So Perfect. anybody anybody going to the Delta Waterfowl Expo will have some of these decoys there for purchase, and then we'll send you guys home with some. So you can, if you got, are you flying there? Are you driving? Uh, probably no. driving. We'll drive to both of them. What is it, an eight-hour drive? Yeah, we'll go to Squad Fest the first week, and we'll be at Delta the second week. But we'll drive. We're not going to fly to Little Rock. No. Baton not, Rouge. So not, if you got Baton Rouge. Rouge. Baton Rouge. I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah. Okay. yeah, if you got a little bit of room, I might send you guys back to the lodge with some of this so you can have it for the season opener. Yep, we'll have them yep. then. I appreciate it very much. I got another idea for you for next year. I'll holler back at you then on that. <laughs> All right. I Thank appreciate you guys. I appreciate everything you've done for yep. me. CedarRunDecoys.com. Yes, Check them out. You can order the decoys right there. Proportions of the Eurasian Widgeon will go to the Ron Stanfield Memorial Scholarship. The proceeds from the yellow rubber ducky is going to go to St. Jude's Children's Hospital. Corey, I appreciate you. God bless you, my friend. Look forward to seeing you this summer. If you're anything else, you holler at me, okay? Appreciate it, guys. We'll see you in a couple months, bud. Thank you. Bye. 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 Great guy. Very, very good man. Good Humble person. man, hard worker. I mean, everything that, you know, His like, like he said, he, he gives a shit about his product because he knows that his family is, you know, that's that's how they make a living. So incredible man. Even cooler in person. I mean, he's he's a sounds like a cool guy there, but if you get a chance to like get him one on one and talk to him at a show, do it. He's an awesome guy to talk to. Yeah, it is. Great dude. Great family. <clears throat> Would you pay $130 for a pair of jeans? I don't know what a pair of jeans cost. No. I paid I haven't bought I, I don't close shop. No, I don't. I had more jeans in years. Uh, I don't know. Fifty bucks seems like my all-in budget on a pair of jeans. Now I've not bought a pair of jeans in a couple of years because they just last. I probably paid eighty bucks for Jabo jeans back in the late eighties, nineties when they were in style. When I was young, and give a shit. Fifty seventy-five. I'll I'll increase my budget seventy-five dollars. I don't even know if what, I'm having to pay. What's a pair of Levi's will cost? I don't know. That's what I'm saying. It's surely seventy-five bucks. Tony. I thought Tony was in here. I was gonna ask him because he wears jeans. I don't know. All American made. American grown, American stitched, 130 bucks for a pair of jeans. From who? Well, I'm not going to divulge that information, Jeff. It's a free plug for them. They don't pay my. They don't pay my. They don't pay my bills. Okay. But I'm just. You were saying that you wouldn't mind spending an extra no, 50 would, bucks if it's American made. Well, I there, was talking about some Filson bibs. There are companies that are making jeans here in America. Those. What's the company's name in uh, Nashville that your mom and I'm a Jean and Willie. I'm a Jean and Willie. That's all American made. All American made. So. You can customize those too. American Dream. Yeah, I would pay extra for my. I don't oh, wear okay, jeans. now he's going to. Well, no, you no, don't I don't. Jeans. I don't wear jeans, right. but I mean, I, I would pay extra for something that was made in America. Yes, I would. Okay. You know the shoes I'm wearing. I'm wearing Columbia. I don't know if these are boat tennis shoes or whatever. I love these things. I got a couple pair of them. I love them. I'd pay extra twenty bucks if they were made in America or thirty. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yep. Interesting. So I would do that. All right. That's it. Love you. Bye. Watch for deer. Oh, go over to our Patreon. Uh, we've got a Patreon account. It's all like behind the scenes type stuff. Um, this is the second year of it. So there, if you're not subscribed, there is a ton of uh, smaller clips and a lot of funny. Does it cost five dollars a month? Three dollars. Three dollars a month. I mean, it ain't. It, we're not breaking. We're not breaking the bank here. No. But uh, you're getting three videos a week. All of them are two to three to five minutes, somewhere in that range. It's all like behind the scenes stuff here at the lodge. Uh, a lot of moments that don't get captured 
that, that are on the first family waterfowl just because i mean they don't go but there's basically a hundred over a hundred videos to watch yeah i if mean you want to go back and catch up on and it's all. a lot of fun so like i said like jeff said there's over a hundred videos and just kind of funny shit that happens around here so go to that it's just patreon the big hunker podcast you can get subscribed to it and uh, like i said three videos a week we're now into the videos from last season and they're funnier than the first one so Go check it out. That's all I got. Uh, love you. Bye. Watch for deer. Go shoot those gobblers. This podcast is brought to you by Pacific Calls, BHP 25. If you're needing uh, duck calls, goose calls for this coming waterfowl season, check them out. BHP 25, Boss Shot Shells, MLR Graphics, Dive Bomb Industry, Dirty Duck Coffee, Shin Gear, Hemp Hill Farm, BHP is the promo code there. Looking Glass Podcast, Lucky Duck, Ducks Unlimited, Mallard Bay, Double T British Kennels, Mossberg, and Stanford Outfitters. 